Hello, this is Stefan Kinsella. Today, uh, as I record this, is Monday, December 17th, 2012. Um, this is uh, should be the first in uh, entry in my podcast, which I am starting soon, called Kinsella on Liberty, Libertarian Theory and Applications, which can be found at stefankinsella.com. Um, and this first entry will be a re-recording of a speech I delivered uh, in September in Bodrum, Turkey at the Property and Freedom Society uh, 7th Annual Meeting. Um, I delivered a talk called The State's Corruption of Private Law, and unfortunately it was the one speech among every other one recorded uh, professionally and in HD quality, etc., uh, in which the audio was messed up uh, through uh, an error. So what I am doing is I have a slideshow presentation, which will be on the blog post accompanying this podcast and available on my website. This will also be put on the Property and Freedom website, which is propertyandfreedom.org. Um, and I did not actually show the slideshow during my speech. I just used it for my notes. Um, I prepared far too many notes for the talk uh, on purpose, uh, 50 or 60 pages of notes, um, and I ended up moving a lot of that to the end for just extraneous material, which is on the slideshow that which you can see accompanying this talk. Um, by the way, my new podcast will be covering uh, just probably on a roughly weekly basis. It will sometimes uh, include old uh, recordings of mine, which um, I put them in the podcast feed and also occasionally cover various libertarian theory and application topics, sometimes respond to Q&A, sometimes I'll have an interview with other libertarians or other people about various matters and put that in the feed. So this is the first, the kickoff podcast, and I plan to re-record the whole thing. Now, my original speech was around 25 minutes, um, but I have a little bit more time here, so it may go a little bit longer, may go a little bit shorter. Um, so if you can follow along with the slides, I'll try to mention the slide here. And um, so let's let's get going, shall we? So it, just as background, I'm on slide two now of my talk. I have links here. Uh, a lot of the background material for this talk is uh, can be found in some uh, some papers I wrote starting in 1995 discussing the nature of legislation and law from a libertarian perspective and. I did a condensed version for the Freeman, which was reprinted with some slight modifications um, a year or so ago in uh, on Mises' uh, Daily, which I have the link for on here. Um, but this talk is not just a presentation of that earlier article, but it draws on a lot of the stuff in there. Um, other useful material for some of the concepts I go into in this can be found in my paper, uh, What Libertarianism Is, and also in Chapter 2 and in other places scattered around Hoppe's Hans Hermann Hoppe's A Theory of Socialism and Capitalism. Now, in my original presentation, which you can see in notes at the end, I had a lot of material on distinguishing between different types of what we call law, positive law, economic law, uh, also discussing the difference between legal positivism and logical positivism which I will not get into here today, but uh, hope hope to someday in the future. And I've written a little bit on it before, and you can see in the notes at the end of the presentation um, some links to blog posts, etc., that I've had on this in case you're ex interested in exploring them further. But what I would like to start with, um, as you can see on slide three, is just talking about the, the nature of illegality and different types of law, the, the concept of law. So let's just start with this idea. We all would agree, or we all understand, that it is considered to be illegal, illegal, or against the law to, say, commit murder in a given jurisdiction. Now, this law is not completely universal because there are exceptions made for the state. If a police officer or a soldier kills someone who is an innocent victim, then that's not considered murder. But as a general rule for under the private criminal law for, ci for, ci for citizens, uh, it's considered to be illegal to commit certain acts like murder. It's also considered to be against the law to sell alcoholic beverages in Houston, Texas, for example, where I live, on a Sunday morning. These are called blue laws. Um, uh, 
and apparently just recently um, uh, the Czech Republic has made it illegal to sell hard liquor. So there's partial prohibition being enacted there because of some uh, recent um, uh, abuses of, of hard liquor. Now, these laws are what we can call legal laws. Um, and most people, when they talk about laws, are talking about the law in society. There's, but the word law is more general than that. There's other types of law. There are moral laws, like things you shouldn't or should not do or should do. Uh, there's a natural law. And then there's causal law, which is like physics, for example, like the law of gravity. And there are economic laws, like the law of supply and demand. So going to slide four. I'm sorry, I think it's slide two. I may be um, messing up here. It's the slide entitled Scarcity and Law. <clears throat> um, okay, I got my slide numbering straight, so... On slide number four now, entitled Scarcity and Law. Um, so let's go back to the origins and the purpose of property rights. We, we live in a world of scarcity. That is, things that can be used as means of action that are not in superabundance. That means that there are things that we need in the world to achieve our ends that only one person can use at a time. Otherwise, there's conflict over these things. Uh, as Hoppe points out, in a world of what we call superabundance or no scarcity, it's hard to imagine such a world, but imagine you know, sort of some ghostly realm or a realm of magic where you can have as much of anything as you want at any time just for the asking. Um, there would actually be no action possible. Now, why is this? Because action is the attempt to achieve something in the future that would not otherwise come about. In other words, you envision some future state of affairs that you don't like or that you think you can change. How do you change it? You change it by acting. That's by employing means, things that can causally interfere with the world to change the outcome of what's going to happen. Um, so basically, in, in our world, we, we always have the choice of acting. We're faced with this choice of acting because... What's going to happen will happen unless we intervene. To intervene means to take advantage of the way cause and effect work. Okay, So without, without the universe being a universe of scarcity, there would be no need to act. There would be no possibility of acting even. There would be no need for learning or knowledge because learning and knowledge is what guides your choice of the means. It's what guides your selection of the ends that you're choosing. So there would be no... No, no possibility of conflict. And this is similar to the idea that in a world of perfect certainty, um, there would be no need to learn, there would be no need for money, and even uh, this is uh, sort of built into the Rothbardian idea of the evenly rotating economy uh, idea. In any case, in a world of scarcity, which we live in, we do need to learn and to understand causal laws. That is, we need to acquire knowledge. Right, And we need to employ, which means to exclusively use, certain means of action, that's scarce resources, so that we can causally achieve our goals. Okay, So we need to acquire resources and we need to acquire knowledge to have successful action. Now this is true you know, even in a Crusoe, wor Crusoe world, uh, uh, not just in a world of uh, multiple human actors. This is even true for someone on a desert island alone by themselves. So this is a fundamental fact of human life, that we do live in a world of scarcity, which makes human action both necessary and possible. That is, without scarcity, human action would be inconceivable, because action necessarily employs scarce means in an attempt to change the outcome of things. In a world of superabundance, basically a magical world, human action would be inconceivable, which is one reason why Mises, for example almost implies that the idea of God is impossible, or at least an acting God, because an acting God is a contradiction in terms, because he is omniscient and omnipotent, and for him to act implies that he is changing what would happen, and that he's dissatisfied right now with the current state of affairs, or with what he predicts is going to come, um, which implies that he's not perfect, because the universe is not 
previously complying with what he wanted, etc. So Mises kind of hints at this incompatibility with the idea of omnipotence and omniscience and the idea of action in general. In any case, so this is where Mises' uh, praxeology comes into our analysis here. Praxeology is Mises' study of the logic of human action. That is, he recognizes that humans act. Now, what does it mean to act? They choose some end, that is, some goal they want to achieve, and then they use their knowledge of the causal laws of the universe to select some scarce means that they think can achieve their desired goal. So in other words, you have some idea that's knowledge of what is possible to change in the future or what's coming and then what you don't like about it and what you would prefer. And you have some knowledge of ways that you can causally interfere to make a change. So you have some knowledge of scientific laws, physical laws of nature, and of what things you can appropriate, use, and select as means of action to achieve your end. So that means that successful action requires two things. Knowledge. Knowledge of what? Of the causal laws of the universe. That's the scientific or the natural sciences, right? Um, and you also need the availability and the control of means. And now these means are necessarily scarce means. If they weren't scarce, they wouldn't be means of action. They would be the background conditions, as Mises points out. And a means is something that's causally efficacious. That is, if you employ it in the right way, it actually helps you achieve some change in the course of events that helps you achieve your goal. Okay, So what's important here, well, in slide five, is uh, talking about scarcity in law, is that if you think about the entire human endeavor, it's always human action. And human action always, to be successful, has to... Um, uh, in, uh, have knowledge and means. These are two different things, but they're both required for successful action. Because if you didn't have any knowledge, you wouldn't know what means to employ. If you didn't have any means available, you wouldn't be able to, no matter what you knew, you wouldn't be able to employ, employ any means to change the course of events. Okay? Now, when there's more than one person in society, okay, that is, we're going away from just the general fact of human action, even in a Crusoe world where there's only one person. When we have more than one person, there arises another thing. That's the possibility of conflict over the use of these scarce resources. So remember, scarce resources are things that serve as means of action, and they're necessarily something that, by their nature, can only be used by one actor at a time, um, which means that all these things are what we call rivalrous. Rivalry means a fight or a conflict. So you can think of scarcity not as the lack of abundance or plentifulness, but you can think of scarcity as rivalrousness or conflictability. That means anything that there can be conflict over by two actors is a possible means of action and a possible object of property rights, which we'll get to, and a possible act, uh, object of law. So when we, when we have more than one person, there's, there's a good thing about that, right? There's a possibility of, of cooperation. Society, language, learning, uh, human interaction, etc. But there's also the possibility of conflict. That is, more than one person may want to use the same thing. So, for example, if if there's a uh, uh, you know a stick that can be used as a club to hunt animals, uh, only A can use it. A and B can't use it at the same time. And if A and B can't agree on whose club it is then A and B would have to fight over it. And so they'd be employing violence and being in a state of war with respect to each other instead of some, at least one of them using the club peacefully and productively um, without fighting with other human actors. So the fundamental fact of scarcity in the world gives rise to the necessity of acting, right? So that means we have to acquire knowledge of causal laws and we have to acquire and employ scarce means. Right? And for humans in society, not just in the world in general, the, the scarcity gives rise to the fundamental social fact of the possibility of conflict over scarce means, including human bodies. Now, when people in society recognize this fact, and when they have a preference for cooperation and for general societal prosperity, which they usually do, right? given human social nature, our relationships with family and neighbors, and the recognition that we 
tend to acquire over time of the immense advantages of a cooperative society having the division and specialization of labor, then humans recognize the need for norms determining who has the right to use the resources, including our bodies, that are, the, that are otherwise subject to conflict. So in other words, we recognize the usefulness and the, and the uh, desirability of having norms or rules that at least make it possible for conflict to be avoided, at least among the people that recognize these norms. So at least there's a recognition for the desirability of norms in allocating who gets to control these scarce resources that we need to use so that they can be used peacefully and productively instead of um, having violent conflict over them. Okay, going on to slide seven. Okay, so what the libertarians believe and what I think is pretty clear from observing human nature and human history um, in, in what's called a society of humans, the ones that are seeking these kind of civilized, peaceful norms, which you could call property rights or laws, um, will tend to naturally gravitate towards the Lockean type of rule, which is the libertarian idea, basically, which is basically this. As Rothbard points out, there are two aspects to the Lockean idea and the libertarian idea. It's, it's a pr pretty simple set of interrelated rules. Number one, in the case of human bodies, who owns the body? And the answer that Locke gives and that libertarians give is that each person owns his body, at least initially. This is called self-ownership. doesn't mean you always necessarily own your body. If you're committing an act of aggression and attacking someone, then you give up your right to completely own your body because the victim has the right to use force against your body in self-defense, So, for example. But at least prima facie or as a default rule or as a presumption, an initial presumption, Every person owns his own body, and – but that's not the only type of scarce resource in the world. Besides human bodies, there are other things out there in the world. Now, these things are the things that are previously unowned. So the rule there is the owner of each external previously unowned resource is the person with the best claim to it, and the person with the best claim to it is either the first user of it because he came first, or someone who has acquired title by contract from a previous owner. So in other words, first appropriation or Lockean homesteading combined with the idea of contract uh, determines who owns all other things other than human bodies. And in the case of your body, whoever is the person, the legal person or the, uh, the soul, if you want to call it that, you don't have to have a, a spiritual concept of these things for it to make sense. But in any case, that's who the owner is. So a set of rules is developed we'll called law, which allocates ownership of all these scarce things. Now, as we get more sophisticated and things develop over time from this kind of crude natural position, uh, if there's a dispute over who gets to control a given thing, then the people in society are going to work out a solution, like informally at first, uh, among themselves, just by negotiation or settlement or compromise or by consensus or custom or something like that, or maybe they'll turn to some respected wise person, a third party, an arbitrator, and thus we have the, you know, um, the phenomena of kings basically arising or, 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 or leaders in society. So over time what you have in a given society is a body of legal rules would emerge, would emerge that would flesh out the application of these basic Lockean style natural property norms, the allocation schemes, it would, it would apply it to various real life situations. So this is what we think of as law or legal law, we should say. Uh, now turning to slide number eight. Um, so then in a more sophisticated society, more developed society, the field of legal scholarship would emerge, which would systematize and categorize and critique and correct uh, the body of law. So then you have like a feedback system where you have judges or decision makers who would refer to the past rules and customs and decisions and solutions and conventions um, and the expectations of parties and also the scholarly works of commentators who've been commentating on the coherence of what's been developing so far. And then the legal scholars would play their role in continually restating and discussing 
and correcting and suggesting you know, corrections to past and, re and recent legal developments. So this is how the body of legal rules emerges in society. Basically, it's a response to the fundamental fact of scarcity, people in society who prefer cooperation and productivity and prosperity and peace to violence and conflict, tend to prefer property allocation norms. Those are going to tend to be the natural Lockean style ones, and then over time it gets more and more developed and more fleshed out. Now, against this kind of backdrop of the libertarian, kind of common sense, maybe simplified perspective of what law is and how it got here, let's talk about the, uh, the state of law today. That is, how, uh, how law is perceived and structured and what its origins are. So in today's world, that's the 21st century, there are two major legal systems um, in the world. There's basically the English common law-based systems, which is, the, of course, the United Kingdom, actually except for Scotland, which is partly civil law, which we'll get to, but most of England, most of the UK, England for sure, and uh, Ireland and uh, Wales, but basically English common law. And also the Commonwealth, former colonies, uh, notably the United States, and also Canada, Australia, uh, and other Commonwealth countries. And then there's the European or the continental civil law-based uh, system. So these are the two major legal systems in the world today. Uh, there's also, of course, Islamic law, uh, Jewish law, international law, which is comprised of the United Nations, uh, uh, treaties, Law of Nations, Laws of War, etc. Now, the common conception is that these two types of law are very different. That we have basically, uh, in the civil law, it's more legal positivistic, that is, more based upon legislation, whereas the common law is more de decentralized. But this is a little bit of a misconception. The, the modern common law systems are based upon the original English common law, but the modern civil law systems are based in their substance on the Roman law. Now, the Roman law came before the English common law, but there's actually something that the Roman law and the common law have in common. They are both largely non-legislation-based, largely decentralized legal systems. Okay, So the two major systems of the world today, the modern common law and the modern civil law, have their origins of their sort of structure and basic legal concepts and legal rules in ancient, long-lived, decentralized, non-legislation-based legal systems. And although the terminology and the con concepts are a little bit different, uh, the basic substance is largely the same on the fundamental issues, property rights, contract rights, etc., the Roman law was basically you know, a thousand-year system from 439 B.C. to about 535 A.D. It is embodied in the Corpus Juris Civilis. That's the body of the civil law that was um, done under, the, under Justinian, the emperor Justinian. And it comprises the code, which was a bunch of uh, codification of the imperial enactments or decrees which is a little bit like legislation, and also the digest, which is one of the most important, which was the collection of the writings of the Roman jurists, and like two of the most important of those were Papinian and Ulpian. And then the Institutes, which was a student textbook. And so the survival of these, of the Corpus Juris Civilis, has helped us to retain the body of the original Roman law, and most importantly the digest and probably the Institutes. Now, modern civil law, um, which... <clears throat> Excuse me, we can date to, in its modern beginning, to the Code Napoleon, the Napoleonic Code, the Civil Code of France in 1804, um, and like the Louisiana Civil Code started four years later in 1808, uh, basically was a modern recodification by legal scholars of the Roman law principles and other principles that had developed in the meantime from in Europe. Um, and the difference, but it, it, in a way, the codes are brilliant and elegant and beautiful codifications of the original Roman law legal science, the principles that had developed uh, in a decentralized fashion in the decisions of, of, of basically courts or legal philosophers considering 
abstract cases. But the codes state in the beginning that you know um, the, the legislature's will is a source of law, and we're, the legislature enacts this code as the basic law. So it enshrines a type of legal positivism and gives legislation the primary um, status as the lawmaker, even though the principles that they're legislating were developed in a decentralized, non-legislated fashion. Now, the common law in England, which we can date from around 1154 to present, um, uh, you know, was also decentralized in a sense like the Roman law before it was. Uh, and then there's other important types of law as well, which I mentioned, the, the law merchant uh, in Europe in the Middle Ages from the 5th to the 15th century, uh, church law, Roman Catholic law, which is called canon law, and Jewish law from about 200, I don't know, 200 AD to, to the present. Um, so, as I mentioned before, um, uh, you could see actually a similarity between the original civil law and the common law in that they're both based on original principles, legal, legal rules developed in a decentralized fashion. But the difference would be that the civil code enshrines legislation as the primary source of law. But in modern times, in the last couple hundred years, what's happened is that um, the, the civil codes have gradually been submerged in a sea of other legislation that are not elegant and codified restatements of previous principles developed in decentralized form, but are special interest statutes, you know, like the tax codes and the, the regulatory state, antitrust law, uh, you know, anti-discrimination provisions, uh, all these kinds of things. So among, say, in France or, you know, some traditional civil law country, the civil code is still important, but it's, a, it's an ever-diminishing part of the law. So the entire system is becoming very legislation bound and not even in a code sense. At least if you're you have legislation which is a code, which is an enactment of previous decentralized legal principles, at least the substance was developed mostly in decentralized form. But nowadays the civil codes are, are, are diminishing in, in importance with the rise of other non code based legislation. And a similar thing has happened with the common law. Gradually, the common law has been codified in many in many uh, important uh, jurisdictions, like the U.S. The United the UCC, the Uniform Commercial Code, has been um, uh, gradually been enacted by legislatures to sort of codify in a legislative form uh, the the private common law as applied to contracts and property law, etc. And even that has been submerged in a flood of legislation, as just as in the civil law. So. Um, so in, 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 in the law today, I'm going to skip over to slide 12 now, um, uh, so what we have is today the common law systems and the civil law systems are actually kind of similar. Both have the core of their private law substance based upon a decentralized system from days in the past, the Roman law in the case of civil law and the original English common law in the case of the common law countries like the U.S. and England. Um, but modern non-code-based legislation has been emer uh, uh, some, uh, just uh, flooding and you know becoming the primary source of law. So what we have is – I'm going to slide 13 now. We have a system – a situation today where even in America, in Canada, in Australia, in England – as well as in Europe, almost everyone now thinks of law as whatever the government's you know, uh, legislature enacts or decrees. In other words, it's legal positivism. So everyone now today thinks of law as whatever the government decrees or says, just like nowadays people think of money not as being some natural, natural phenomena that emerges in a decentralized way on a free market like gold is money, but – they think of money as whatever fiat currency the government's central bank is going to issue or has issued. Sorry. So, um, so now the problem is that the common conception of law today is some written rule. Okay, it has to be written down. You'll hear people talk about but what what's on the law books. Even you know income tax protesters in the U.S., for example, they'll say something like um, income tax is not illegal. 
And when you say, yes, it is, because you'll go to jail <laughs> if you don't pay your income tax, they'll say, show me the law. So what they're asking for is a, they want you to show them a written law from the legislature. So even they are sort of accepting that law is whatever the government decrees it to be, and unless the government decrees something, it's not really a law. So even they are accepting this idea of legislative uh, legal positivism. And by the way, uh, I can't go into this in detail now, but uh, Hoppe in his article on nations, uh, uh, banking nation states, uh, which is uh, in his book, uh, I think in Economics and Ethics of Private Property, also on his website, Hans Hoppe dot com, uh, you know, he talks about how the government, as a territorial monopolist, the way it insidiously takes control of society is to gradually take over the various important institutions of society, and over time make the people believe that it's the only provider of, if not the originator of, all these essential aspects of society. So it takes over and then it co-ops and it corrupts institutions and practices like money and education and transportation, like roads, etc., communications like you know the internet and radio, etc., newspapers, um, defense and justice, and of course law. By the way, Hoppe has noted before that um, – uh, he's he's had a few remarks which I found interesting on the common versus the civil law. Uh, I came from Louisiana, which is the only civil law state in the U.S. It's kind of a hybrid state, but it does have a civil code. And so I've gone through phases where um, at first I thought the civil law was superior, like when I was in law school, because it's based upon this kind of rationalist idea of a perfect planning. But when you become more of a libertarian, you start realizing, well, maybe the decentralized approach of the common law is better. And now I've kind of come back to the idea that, well, but the common law is not really any better any more than the civil law because it's not really any more decentralized any more than the civil law is. Um, they're both you know, basically legis legally – legal. they're both beholden to the idea of legal positivism. They're both um, systems which have tons of special interest legislation uh, that have you – know, basically are starting to dominate the entire field of law. And the entire conception of law has changed among the people in both systems. So uh, I no longer believe the common law is really, uh, is really that superior. Um, and in fact, the civil law in terms of its substance is better than the common law in a lot of ways because, number one, the concepts are less bound up with feudalism. So they're cleaner, more streamlined, more elegant, conceptually more kind of Lockean libertarian, I believe. Uh, instead of talking about fee simple ownership and all these kind of bizarre things, it's just ownership. Um, and also, the idea, as Hoppe points out, um, uh, you know, if you codify the private law, now this was done by scholars. Granted, it was enacted by the legislature, but the key, um, you know, um, the key thing to uh, appreciate about the civil law is that, it, or the civil code, it was based upon a civil code which was written in fairly simple, precise. Short, elegant language that was pretty easy to understand even by a layman. Um, so, you know, there are some people like I think Weber has suggested that the common law lawyers are a little bit too proud in thinking that the common law is so superior. And a lot of libertarian legal scholars have, have sort of for a long time assumed that the common law is superior because it's decentralized. But what is this opposition to codification? I mean, there's some thinking that it was because, you know, you didn't want to make it easy for the layman to understand. Uh, you wanted to, uh, you know, make it the province of the lawyers, the specialists. You know, laymen have to go to a lawyer in the common law to figure out what's going on because it's not easy to understand all this. So, I would say that there are some benefits to the idea of civilian codification. Uh, granted, I'm on slide 14 now. Granted, the main problem is that it enshrines the idea of legislative supremacy. Um, and uh, in the common law, they have some codification advantages too. They have the restatements of law. There's the UCC, etc. And also, common law. The common law has also become dominated by legislation. So, you know, these systems are really very similar in broad form nowadays. So let's skip over slide 15, which kind of summarizes some of that. And um, and let me just quote one thing by Hans Hoppe, which he, it was an answer to a question I had to him from a class I taught at the Mises Academy on Hoppe's thinking. And uh, 
I summarized some of the stuff I just mentioned, and Hoppe said, I agree entirely with your assessment here. I think the better analytic distinction is between private law and public law, not between, say, civil law and common law. And that both common law and civil law were initially largely private law and have both become over time increasingly public or legislative or statutory law. And I agree with Hans. I think he's right. Uh, turning to slide 17, let me mention something um, that I found very interesting in some of my studies on this topic. Um, back in 1884, there was a paper by a lawyer named James Carter called a Propo The Proposed Codification of Our Common Law. Um, and this was um, a criticism by Carter, a New York lawyer, of the attempt by David Dudley Field to legislatively codify New York's common law. And Carter opposed replacing case law, which was sort of a decentralized legal system, with centralized legislation. Uh, he had several arguments. Number one, case law precedents are flexible, and they allow the justice, the judge to do justice. That's what his attempt is uh, when he hears a dispute between parties, to find the right solution. But statutes, by contrast, that is legislation, they have to be applied literally even where injustice is done or the legislator didn't contemplate the result that the, the application of a statute would result in in a certain case. Um, uh, and we see this today, of course, with copyright law, with uh, statutory damages, people going to jail for years for – or even for life for just a couple of relatively minor uh, drug offenses because that's what the statute requires. Um, so Carter's argument was that if you replace organically developed law with artificial legislation, it changes the role of the courts and judges from one where the judge is searching for justice – into a mere squabble over definitions of words that are found in statutes. And then, of course, the state controls what words are there in the first place by legislation, which is really just the, a decree. Uh, there's a fantastic quote by him, which I'll read here, slide 18. Um, At present, when any doubt arises in any particular case as to what the true rule of the unwritten, that is, common law developed law, is – it is at once assumed that the rule most in accordance with justice and sound policy is the one that, which must be declared to be the law. The search is for that rule. The appeal, that is the, the arguments of the lawyers, is squarely made to the highest considerations of morality and justice. These are the rallying points of the struggle. The contention is ennobling and beneficial to the advocates, to the judges, to the parties, to the auditors, and so indirectly to the whole community. The decision, that is the, the court's decision in a given case, then made records another step in the advance of human reason towards that perfection after which it forever aspires. But when the law is conceded to be written down in a statute, and the only question is what the statute means, a contention unspeakably inferior is substituted. Now the dispute is about words. The question of what is right or wrong, just or unjust, is irrelevant and out of place. The only question is, what has been written? What a wretched exchange for the manly encounter upon the elevated plane of principle. Anyway, that's a great, uh, that's a great quote, and as I mentioned before, um, you know, we, we see this question being played out today in all these legal disputes now, especially in the criminal and the punitive law. In copyright law, where the only question the jury has to answer is, did this guy copy something? And then the judge has to award millions of dollars in statutory damages because the statute requires it, but it has nothing to do with the real amount of damages suffered or justice or drug cases, for example. The only question the jury has to answer is, did this guy sell marijuana? It's got nothing to do with justice, and if the guy goes to jail for 15 years or life because the statute requires it, well, that's what happens. So justice becomes irrelevant when statutes become the dominant source of law. Uh, going on to slide 20, now some of this is pointed out in my earlier articles on legislation. Um, there are other negative effects of having legislation become a dominant source of law or the primary source of law. Uh, in fact, with just thinking of law as being made by legislation or thinking of legislation as law at all, uh, of having a legislature. I mean there's an old saying that uh, 
you know, your property rights are never safe when the legislature's in session. That sort of encapsulates a lot of what's wrong with just having a state or a legislature in the first place. Anyway, the uh, the Italian legal theorist Bruno Leone, who uh, who died tragically young in the uh, 20th century, um, what he pointed out was there is much more certainty, right, in a decentralized legal system like the original Roman law or the common law, than in a centralized system based upon legislation. Because in a legislation-based system, you have a legislature which is seen as the primary source of law and is seen, seen as having the right to change the law whenever they wish. Um, so they can change the law from day to day. So that means we are less certain what the legal rules are going to be next year or tomorrow. Uh, but judicial decisions, if, if we have a decentralized system where law develops organically over time in a decentralized system like the common law or the Roman law, um, legal certainty is enhanced. And that's because judges and judicial decisions are much less able to affect legal uncertainty. Um, there are several reasons for this. Number one is if you think about the position of a judge or a court in a common law system, for example, uh, unlike legislators, the judge, number one, he can only make a decision when he's asked to do so by the parties concerned. He can't just wake up one morning and start writing a new tax law or a new America's Disabilities Act or – uh, anti-discrimination legislation. You know, he's got to have two parties with an actual concrete dispute, and they have to have standing. And he has to then he can hear that case. Uh, number two, his decision is not a society-wide decision. Usually, it's only affecting the parties to the dispute, and it only occasionally affects third parties. And also because judges are seen as trying to do justice and they're seen as developing upon and relying upon previous expectations and customs and the existing body of law as people understand it that is precedence that is in other words the judges feel compelled and are expected to refer to previous precedent of other judges and they have to sort of either uh, find a decision that's compatible with what's gone before or they have to explicitly say look I'm going to Break from break from precedent and not follow stare decisis here, uh, but they have to give a reason for that. And if their reasoning is too far out of bounds, then their decision is seen as anomalous instead of establishing a new rule for society. So their discretion is limited. So this means basically judges can't legislate, which is by the which is one reason by the way which patent and copyright, which I oppose strongly, because they're completely legislated artificial systems, uh, could never arise in a decentralized legal system. Um, a lot of libertarians who kind of admit the point that we shouldn't have a state or at least shouldn't make law by legislation, um, they they say that, well, you could still have patent and copyright. Even though they're, they're legislated today, even if they weren't legislated, you could still have them arise somehow in a, in a decentralized common law type system. Um, I think they're just wrong. They don't know what they're talking about. Um, another negative effect of the uncertainty – so basically when you have a legislation-based system, legal uncertainty is increased in society. Um, and you know, so for example, legislation would tend to interfere with agreements people have made. Um, and so uh, in other words, the value of contracts decreases in a legislation-based system because the confidence you have that your agreement – your contract with someone else will be enforced in the future is lowered. Okay, So that means that contracts are valued less than otherwise. In other words, people rely less on the ability to contract or engaging in contracting than they otherwise would. So they, they tend to develop more costly alternatives like structuring their companies and transactions in certain ways um, because they can't rely upon contracts. So that distorts the economy and leads to inefficiency. Um, also, when you have an increase in uncertainty in general in society because we have legislation as the source of law and that can change from day to day, then overall time preference in society is, is, is uh, increased. In other words, when the future is made less certain or made more uncertain, then your preference for future grat uh, present gratification over future increases, which is rational, but basically it leads to an an in increase in overall time preference, which means people are less willing to forego immediate benefits like consumption, uh, 
and they're less willing to invest their time and their capital in more indirect or that it's more roundabout or lengthier production processes, which would otherwise yield more or better goods for consumption or further production. So in other words, just the increase in uncertainty gives rise to an increase in time preference, which reduces economic efficiency and economic prosperity. By how much, we can't say, but we know that this is a tendency. And Hoppe has written a lot about this in his Time Preference um, and Decivilization article. And of course, um, when you increase time preference, you also uh, uh, in lead to more crime. So that's another negative effect of legislation. So legislation leads to inefficiencies in a variety of ways, to distortion of the economy, um, it leads to a change of attitude of people about what law means and the connection between law and justice. Okay? And it leads to more crime. You know, as Hoppe explains, as people become more present oriented, then immediate or criminal gratification becomes relatively more attractive than it would have been because the future punishment, which is uncertain and now is even more uncertain, is less of a deterrent to their commission of crime and getting immediate gratification in the present. Now, turning to um, slide 23, uh, Hoppe, in his article on time preference and democracy, um, re refers to some studies by uh, Banfield, Banfield um, about how when you have democratic lawmaking or legislation, see, Hoppe calls legislation democratic lawmaking, which I think is basically right. Uh, it increases time preferences, etc., and it increases crime not only because of the increase in time preference, but because of the change of the attitude about what law is. So here's a quote. Um, the mere fact of legislation of democratic lawmaking increases the degree of uncertainty. Rather than being immutable and hence predictable, law becomes increasingly flexible and unpredictable. What is right or wrong today may not be so tomorrow. The future is thus rendered more haphazard. Consequently, all-around time preferences degrees will arise, will rise, consumption and short-term orientation will be stimulated, and at the same time, the respect for all laws will be systematically undermined and crime will be promoted, for if there is no immutable standard of right, then there is also no firm definition of crime. Uh, that's a quote by Hoppe, by the way, drawing upon Banfield. He goes on, slide 24, one must first work for a while before one gets paid. In contrast, specific criminal activities such as murder, assault, Rape, robbery, theft, and burglary require no such discipline. The reward for the aggressor is tangible and immediate, whereas the sacrifice, possible punishment, lies in the future and is uncertain. And by the way, uh, Guido Holtzman has a nice paper, a nice lecture um, in the Mises University 2011, which I have linked here, on the division of labor and social order, which does a, a really nice job of explaining uh, the role of low time preference in extending the division of labor and savings and capital accumulation and productivity and wealth. So take a look at that too. That's complementary to all this talk. Now, when we have a society like we have now where legislation becomes the primary source of law, then of course we have a, a, a flood or an outpouring of artificial law which gradually submerges these the good parts of the law, the private law, the common law rules of property and contract, etc., and the civil law rules of of private law as well. We have, in addition to the effects I've just mentioned, we have a lot of other insidious effects. So number one, special interest groups become more successful and then others have to arise for self-defense. So then we soon have a legal war of all against all that starts to emerge in society. So then everyone's led into conflict rather than cooperation. And remember, the whole point of law is to permit cooperation and to avoid conflict. And also, when you have so many laws it becomes impossible for every citizen, for any citizen, to avoid being a lawbreaker, uh, especially given the perverse positivistic rule that ignorance of the law is no excuse. So we all become lawbreakers, and we are all lawbreakers. We can't help but violating the law. Uh, and that discredits the law. It discredits the idea of the law. So people start to you know, feel free to disobey the law when they want to, which is good for artificial laws but not so good for valid laws. And it also allows the state to selectively and arbitrarily enforce you know, whatever law they want to against whoever the troublemaker of the day is. And there's another important Italian legal theorist, Giovanni Sartori, 
he pointed out that one another problem with legislation is that when legislation is thought of by the by society by the people as the primary source of law they become more accustomed to following orders right they become more docile more servile less independent and you know he argues that once people lose their rebellious spirit then it's easier for the government to increase its power and become more tyrannical so this is all a good summary of the reason why we must end the practice of legislation or at least we have to recognize that legislated laws have no connection whatsoever to justice. So I'll end this talk here. I hope you've enjoyed it. There's a lot more on this topic, and the slides following slide 27 cover a lot of the other things we could talk about. Um, I do intend to take Q&A in this podcast, so anyone who has questions about what I've discussed here or other topics in the, in the, uh, the, the slides at the end or any other libertarian topic, feel free to email me or post in the comments on the blog the podcast of the blog, the blog of the podcast, I should say, and I'll be happy to uh, consider uh, addressing them in an upcoming uh, podcast. Thanks. See you next week.